Lovely day here in Nova Scotia, and Halifax at least. I was just talking to my mom. It's not as warm down in Guysboro. That's where we're moving in a couple of months. We'll wait and see. We just kind of closed a deal on a house. Pretty excited about that. Anyhow, we're going to jump into this piece to start day with... Here in Nova Scotia well, well, well. And Halifax. We're going to jump into this piece just to segue into the question period. This is Bobby Cooper, or pardon me, Michael Cooper... He's something else. He's a cowboy from Ontario. Let's take a peek at uh, what he's doing. After that, we should be able to swing right into question period, which should be starting shortly. Going to get busy here saying hello to everybody. Give me a moment to get set up. Let's start playing some Michael Cooper. The government of Canada. Let's now get this going. Parliament is holding hearings to get to the bottom of how this massive national security failure happened under Justin Trudeau's watch. Mark Holland was the first witness. He's Justin Trudeau's health minister. When he came to committee, he claimed that Justin Trudeau's health agency, which was responsible for overseeing the lab, including these two scientists, at all times acted appropriately. And that when it comes to accountability, there will be no accountability. Nobody will be fired, according to Holland. So let me walk through how Justin hey, Lightning Rod, what's up? handled this major national security failure after serious red flags were raised, and you be the judge of whether Justin Trudeau's health agency acted appropriately. As early as August of 2018, there were red flags that these two scientists were potentially agents of Beijing. The head of the Winnipeg lab even raised this with CSIS. What did Justin Trudeau's health agency do in the face of that? In October of 2018, Justin Trudeau's health agency entered into an agreement at the initiation of one of the two scientists, Dr. Chu, to transfer Ebola What's up, and M? Kenipa How are you? to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. In other words, Justin Trudeau's health agency entered into an agreement to transfer two of the most deadly pathogens to the Beijing re regime at the request of a scientist that they knew was a potential agent of the Beijing regime. And not only that, it took months before Justin Trudeau's agency launched an investigation. Remember, red flags were issued in August of 2018. Hey Derek, what's up? It wasn't until December hey Patty, what's of 2018 up? that an investigation was launched. Finally, in March of 2019, an investigation report was issued, and it found that, indeed, these two scientists were potential agents of Beijing, that they had engaged in multiple intellectual property and security breaches, and that they had collaborated with the People's Liberation Army. What did Justin Trudeau's health agency do with that information? Did they fire the scientists? No. Did they restrict their access to the lab? No, they didn't do that either. Instead, literally Reveal one week later, Justin Trudeau's health agency actually transferred 15 strains of Ebola and Hanapa to Wuhan. You can't make this stuff up. And not only that, stuff up, these scientists, which Justin Trudeau's health agency at that point, as of March, knew definitively was collaborating with Beijing, with the People's Liberation Army. Good day, Doc from Canada. How are you doing? Unfettered access Good to, see you. to the lab. This is Canada's highest security lab. It's a lab that handles some of the most deadly pathogens and protects some of Canada's most sensitive biological secrets. And here you have agents of Beijing working there freely and on and on an unrestricted basis. It wasn't until July of 2019, nearly one year after initial red flags were raised, that the two scientists, agents of Beijing, were finally marched out of the Winnipeg lab. So in the face of all of that, Mark Holland's claim that Justin hey, Tigger, what's up? Trudeau's How are you? health agency at all times acted appropriately is patently absurd. 
after three years hey, Serena, on what's part up? of Justin Trudeau and his government to try to cover up this massive national security failure, including by withholding the Winnipeg lab documents from Parliament and from Canadians. Mark Holland's claim is just another attempt on the part of Justin Trudeau's government to avoid responsibility and accountability by defending the indefensible. And it tells you everything you need to know about Justin Trudeau's government's complete failure protect Canada's national security in the face of the very real threat posed by the Beijing-based communist regime. The face All right, of the very gang. real... Uh, whoops. So the next piece we're going to drop into is question period. We've got that on the go. We'll drop in here quickly. All participants of the and 2024 we should be Sudbury good to go. Regional Science Fair. Here we go. I also want to extend a big congratulations to this year's Another winners. Another 10 minutes or so, Benjamin we Kawa, should kick Felix this thing Nog, off. Eden Abels, Jack O'Connell, Violent Simon, Camille Landry, and Xavier Small. Wishing all of you the best of luck at the national competition. Go Team Llewellyn. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon University. Madam Speaker, the science is in. What's terrible for your pocketbook, for your health, and the economy? Paper straws, and they suck. And yet this radical Liberal government wants to force everyone to use them. After nine long years of this Liberal government, read, Rose, they what's and up? the paper straws are not worth the cost. Everything is getting more expensive, while the Liberals focus on banning things that science shows that are better for the environment, better for you, and better for the... Hey, Sheila company. Hall, what's going on? Canada should be a superpower in plastics recycling. Hey, Sheila. And we will be just not under this current Prime Minister. Limp, wet, and utterly useless. Paper straws and Liberal governments are not worth the cost. The, the Honourable Member for Nipian. Madam Speaker, the Nipian Nighthawks Field Hockey Club is dedicated to fostering a love for field hockey among youth. Field hockey in Ottawa stretches back to the 1950s. A recent explosion of participation in Ottawa region began in 2007. Interestingly, unlike globally, 70% of Ottawa members are female. Nepian Nighthawks' vision includes fostering sport participation for life. Their goals include reaching out to un underserved communities in Ottawa and build a world-class field hockey complex to serve the local field hockey community. This club is particularly noted for its inclusive Stick Together program, which emphasizes teamwork, sportsmanship, and the development of field hockey skills for all ages and skill levels. The Nighthawks are committed to reconciliation and actively promote the participation of Indigenous youth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Scarborough North. Madam Speaker, April is Oral Health Month in Canada, an opportunity to highlight good oral health as an essential component of overall health. In Scarborough North, the Filipino-Canadian Dental Hygienist Society has offered no-cost dental hygiene services to residents in need. Most recently, they partnered with the Filipino Centre Toronto and the Chinese Cultural Centre of Greater Toronto to provide drop-in checkups and cleanings. When I visited their mobile dental clinic last Sunday, I was met by bright smiles, and I thanked the volunteer dentists and Rural dental Sean hygienists Chen. for their tireless efforts. This month, the Canadian Dental Association reminds everyone to brush twice a day, floss daily, check for signs of gum disease, and visit their dentists regularly. Now, with the new Canadian Dental Care Plan, up to 9 million people without coverage will soon have access to the dental care they need. Merci. The Honourable Member for Caribou Prince George. It's an honour to rise today and recognize the work of my friend Barb Ward Burkett, who is the Executive Director of Prince George Native Friendship Centre. Also recogni uh, recognizing an incredible program that started in my riding at Caribou Prince George. What started as a small grassroots movement, a movement to end violence against women and children, has grown into an inter international inspiration supported by millions. 
spurred on by the incredible loss and sorrow of families of over 20 women and girls who disappeared or have been murdered on the infamous Highway 16, Highway of Tears, Raven Lassert and her father Paul have taken one single moose hide and turned it into an international movement, a movement that has spurred thousands of conversations, workshops, marches and meetings. Today I'm extremely proud to honour Barb and the Moose Hide campaign for their boundless efforts to end violence against Indigenous women and girls. On April 30th, Barb will be re represented the five millionth Moose Hide pin in recognition of her tireless work. Thank you, Barb, and to the Moose Hide campaign. The Honourable Member for Mississauga, Erin Mills. Madam Speaker, as this week has been National Volunteer Week, I'd like to take a moment today to She's speak the about the importance guys. of volunteer work. Dirty Each year, clean. the Canada Revenue Agency congratulates and thanks volunteers from across the country, particularly because thousands of them actively help support free tax clinics under the Community Volunteer Income Tax Program. Last year, these free tax clinics made it possible for almost 650,000 Canadians with a modest income to file their taxes and receive more than $1.75 billion in benefits, credits and refunds. More than 3,400 community organizations composed of more than 14,700 volunteers contributed to achieving these results. I encourage all members to take a moment to thank all of these phenomenal volunteers and this program. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Yud Aleph Nissan is approaching, marking 122 years since the Lubavitcher Rebbe's light began to illuminate the world. The spiritual giant of the Jewish people, the Rebbe's teaching transcends borders and touches all of humanity. He was one of the most prolific thinkers in the recent history of Judaism, whose deep interpretation of Torah and Talmud and Halakha and Kabbalah and philosophy and Hasidus guides Jews and non-Jews everywhere. In his teachings and his letters, every verse in the story eternal to Torah is as relevant today as when it was given at Sinai, and we find the answers to our most profound questions. Those teachings, hey Luke, what's up? With, with the help daily day, of Rabbi Blue, how are you? of Thornhill, inspire me throughout my private and public life. In the 17? face of darkness, and there is a lot of darkness. We should remember the Rebbe's wisdom and his love for every Jew and every person. And on this day, we are reminded to strengthen his call to bring light into the world, to participate, to share, to invest in education, and to deepen the moral foundations through clarity and the existence of Jews everywhere. Nice. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning. Madam Speaker, after nine years of this NDP Liberal government, Canadians are struggling to make ends meet. The Liberal April Fool's joke was a 23% carbon tax increase. April Fool's jokes are supposed to last one day, but this one continues fueling high inflation. In Ottawa, the Prime Minister's policies made the price of gas at the pumps jump by 20 cents, nearly 20 cents a litre, reaching their highest level since 2022. Still, the Liberals pretend their tax and spend policies are helping Canadians. When will this government start helping start helping people instead of hurting them. When will they do the right thing and pass Bill C-234 to axe the tax on farmers and food? One thing we know for sure, as prices on everything continues to, to, to go up, driven by costly carbon tax, this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. That's Thank right. you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Vimy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My address to this House today is a solemn declaration of our duty to remember one of the darkest chapters to find in modern out, Luke. history. The systematic destruction of a people by the Ottoman Empire during the Armenian Genocide. Let us take this moment to honour the memory of the 1.5 million innocent lives lost or destroyed just over a century ago. Let us remember that this happened to people who had been living in Anatolia for 1,500 years. Just a few months ago, after two millennia of existence, the Armenian enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh in Azerbaijan basically ceased to exist. With Turkish military support and Russia's inaction as peacekeepers, Azerbaijan's military offensive ended with the region's 100,000 Armenians fleeing as refugees to Armenia. Let us recognize the pain and suffering endured hey, Ernest, of the Armenian up? people and commit to never forget the Armenian genocide. The Honourable Member for Windsor West. 
Today, I recognize the accomplishments of esteemed historian and Black Canadian heritage expert Elise Harding Davis. Throughout her career, Elise elevated positive Black history in Canada, earning many accolades, including the Order of Ontario designation, being named a 100 accomplished Black Canadian woman, receiving the Ontario Black Historical Society's Daniel Hill Award, the Ontario Museum Association's Award of Excellence, and the Queen Elizabeth Diamond and Jubilee Medals, the Ontario Historical Society's Connachian Award as well. Over 60 years, Elise has highlighted how African Canadians were essential to Canada's development and was the first black female curator at the Amherstburg Freedom Museum. Elise comes from a family of strong character. Her late sister, Shelley Harding-Smith, was Canada's first black female master electrician and activist who was a friend and a mentor to me personally. Their great-grandfather was a slave, and both Elise and Shelley progressed in a challenging world where they left nothing, let nothing stand in their way. August 1st this year will mark the 90th anniversary of Emancipation Day, marking the day Canada's Slavery Abolition Act came into effect. Canada still needs to apologize for the slave and the black Canadians. An official apology would mean the, a lifetime of work recognized. Elise exemplifies the true meaning of preserving black history in Canada. Her legacy will no doubt inspire future generations. The Honourable Member for Laurentie de la Belle. Next Monday is Earth Day, the planet's leading environmental event. This day seeks to cultivate our awareness of environmental and climate issues. Let's recall a few facts. July 2023 was the hottest month in human history. And last month was the 10th consecutive month to break a heat record. Right here in Quebec and in the rest of Canada, unprecedented wildfires ravaged our forests and made the air in our cities the most polluted in the world last summer. We're in a climate emergency and Canada's slowness to wean itself off oil is a millstone around our neck. So anyone who calls himself an environmentalist should support Quebec independence. With our clean energy, we would finally have the latitude to become an example to follow, maybe even inspire our neighbour, Canada. As a woman concerned about climate security and as a sovereigntist, I'm convinced that Quebec being a country would be good for everyone. Hagen Shushwap. Speaker, Canadians, especially in British Columbia and the North Okanagan Shuswap, see it, are seeing that after nine years, this Prime Minister and his NDP Liberal government are simply not worth the cost. Their April 1st he kind of looks like a Mel carbon Arnold, tax increase he? has seen gas prices pass, push past $1.75 per litre in the interior and over the $2 mark in other parts of BC. The carbon tax only adds to the cost for farmers who have no choice but to pay if they're produ to produce food for Canadian families. One chicken farmer in the Shuswap paid over $100,000 last year alone just for his carbon tax bill. Because of this NDP Liberal government, that carbon tax bill will increase another 23% this year, making it even more difficult for Canadian families to afford food. Will the Prime Minister take the step to axe the tax on farmers and food and immediately, by immediately passing Bill C-234 in its original form, or will he continue to prove that he and his NDP partners are simply not worth the cost? The Honourable Member for Toronto, Danforth. Today I rise to commemorate the 50th anniversary of a significant moment in Canadian queer women's history, the Brunswick Four. In 1974, Adrian, Pat, Sue and Lamar were arrested for refusing to leave the Brunswick House, a popular Toronto bar, after they had taken the stage to sing the song I Enjoy Being a Dyke during an amateur performance night. They, were, they returned as an act of defiance, but were met with violence at the hands of police and they were charged. Dubbed the Brunswick Four, a legal defence fund was set up in their name and at trial, all charges were dismissed except for one for disturbing the peace. Long subjected to police harassment, the Brunswick Four became a symbol of resistance for the gay and lesbian community. Their determination to combat systemic prejudice serves as an inspiration, especially in the fight for a 2SLGBTQIA plus community. Thank you. Here we go. Let's get her kicked off. April 19th. Let's go. Melissa Lansman, that's good people like her. NDP Liberal Prime Minister at 
that he's just not worth the cost. Former bank governor and proud liberal David Dodge says a new federal budget certainly is not helpful to dealing with the inflationary fire, making it harder for Canadians' families to afford anything. Young people saddled with this prime minister's addiction to spending. The call is coming from inside of the Liberal House. Will the prime minister listen to experts, to business leader, to his own party, and millions of Canadians struggling to get by and just stop the spending? Stop it. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The lowest debt and deficit oh, in the G7, no. Madam Speaker, a triple A credit rating, and a budget that presents a, me a message of fairness for this country, fairness for current and future generations, a vision that they would cut. They already, before even reading the budget, said that they would not support it. That is a budget that supports child care, that supports pharmacare, and understanding that Canadians have to have dental care in this country. Canadians who can't otherwise afford it will have the support of this government. And that more homes be built, Mr. Uh, Madam Speaker. That is vital in this country, and they're standing against every single one of those. Good answer. Member for Thornhill. Good answer. Madam Speaker, the problem is, is that nobody believes them anymore, and this budget is the opposite of fairness. It is unfair to saddle our kids with billions of dollars of debt that they'll be paying for years. It is unfair to force the inflationary spending onto grocery bills of every single family. It is unfair to keep interest rates high while millions struggle to pay their mortgages. The, the number of Canadians who can't afford to pay their bills has more than doubled over the last month. So will the Liberals finally fix the budget so Canadians can keep their homes, put gas in their cars, and put food on their table? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition and the Conservative Party seem to be good at Turnbull's posing for photo thicket. ops and pretending to care about people in food bank lineups. While our government has introduced the most care. comprehensive package they of competition care. reforms in Canadian history to increase competition and bring down grocery prices. But how cruel and heartless do you have to be mm. as care. a party to vote against feeding kids That's in school? Right. Shame. Shame. What's up, and Nismo? That how are you? over there has yeah. voted once already against the National School Food Program, and we've introduced it in Budget 2024, and we're going to see them vote. Well, member for Thornhill. Mirror, mirror on the wall. That's all I hear from that member. The speaker, the, the, Mr. Madam Speaker, the spending spree just isn't limited to the costly government photo ops that he's talking about. He's been here for nine years. The Liberal insiders and elites are the ones getting on, in on the action too. We learned this week that the RCMP raided the home of a guy who grifted $20 million of taxpayers for the Arrive Scam app. The Prime Minister failed to get the money back. This House ordered it. So will someone over there tell their boss to get the cash back? That's right. Yeah. The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, uh, as I said yesterday in the House, uh, our government takes the use of taxpayers' money extremely seriously. We welcome investigations. We welcome investigations, Madam Speaker, that are taking place, including the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Uh, that, as is well known, publicly raided a residence uh, earlier this week. Madam Speaker, we've said anybody who abused taxpayers' money will face the consequences, and of course, we will seek to recuperate all money that Absolutely. has been misallocated. That's right. Yeah. The Honourable yeah. Member for Bose. Madam Speaker, after nine years of this Prime Minister who's not worth the cost, our farmers are crying out in large numbers this morning in Bose to express their anger at a government that's completely out of touch with reality. Our farmers are being asked to fill our pantries while the Bloc Liberal Coalition is blocking passage of Bill C-234, which would remove the carbon tax on propane and natural gas used to heat buildings and dry grain in order to lower food prices. Will the Prime Minister and the Bloc use common sense and say yes to this request from Canadian hey, farmers? Mike McIntyre, the hey, Parliamentary Secretary to the What's Minister up? of Agriculture Good day, Bud and Wilson. Food. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I'd like to thank my colleague for the question. I find it strange that a member f for Quebec would ask this question about C-234 because it won't apply to Quebec. But last week, they had an opportunity to prioritize this bill. But what did they do? They switched it with a different bill. So they have to walk the talk, Madam Speaker. He should convince his colleagues to move forward on C-234. The Honourable Member for Bose. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
this answer just proves how out of touch this government is. I invite the government on the block to go to Boast today and tell farmers that the carbon tax doesn't apply in Quebec. I've got room in my car after question period. No farmers, no food, Madam Speaker. Something the Bloc Liberal Coalition just doesn't get. The Bloc wants to radically increase the carbon tax again, proving once again that a vote for the Bloc will cost you dearly. When will the government finally pass Bill C-234 in its original form, Madam Speaker? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, I don't know why it's a member for Quebec who's asking this question, because the bill will have no impact on Quebec. I would understand if it was coming from a member from Ontario. This member needs to convince his colleagues to move forward with C-234. It's their bill. They have that opportunity. They had the opportunity, but two or three times they've swapped it out for something else. Something else. That's not our fault. That's their fault. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Madam Speaker, yesterday my colleague for Drummond read the minister page 83 of the 2024 budget, which reads, expanding access to halal mortgages. The minister replied, no, no, we want to limit it. We just want to explore it, look at it, see if there's anything we can do. And besides, it's private. It's not a government program. In short, a great amount of unease. If they don't know where they're going with their halal mortgages, if it's not up to the government, if they want to frame it rather than expand it, what's it doing in the someone, budget? Someone, how are you? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, and merci beaucoup pour la question. Thanks very much for the question. Not mean exclusion, and that's why we really need to make sure that we are protecting Canadians with products that already exist within our financial institutions, within private companies. And that's why the government is now announcing to consult with financial service providers and, uh, and diverse communities to understand how federal policies can protect Canadians from abuses. And I hope that all parties across the aisles can get on board with this to make sure that Canadians in this financial times, in these economic times, are protected. The the Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Madam Speaker, we may have a partial answer. Over the past few months, the media have been reporting dissatisfaction among members of the Muslim community with certain positions taken by the Liberal government. According to Radio Canada, a Muslim group even threatened to cut off the Liberal Party's funding of $680,000. That would mean they're leaving the Liberals for the NDP and the Conservatives. The Liberal solution, as always, is to pander. Are halal mortgages in the budget an olive branch extended to a fringe of the Muslim community? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker. I think the bloc is going off the rails a little bit. They don't know where they're heading with this. They don't want to vote in favor of the budget. Uh, even though there's good things in it for Quebec, there's a whole bunch of things that are, are important to Quebecers. So they don't want to talk about those things because they know it's good for Quebecers, but it's not good for the bloc. Excuse uh, the honorable member Chris the Fly Guy, Smith. average viewer, good Pay day. Your bills or buy your groceries. See, That's Marie the Barron, dilemma come on. for too many Canadians. Big oil and gas are doing just fine by gouging Canadians at the pumps and making record pro profits. Why? Because this government lets them. Liberals caved to lobbyists and stepped back instead of making big oil pay what they owe. And don't expect better from Conservatives because they're focused on taking Canadians' dental care and free medication. Why is this government letting ultra-rich CEOs rip off Canadians. Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. By eliminating inefficient f fossil fuel subsidies, Madam Speaker, by eliminating or introducing rather a What's tax up? on unacceptable fringe. Buybacks. Good to see you. Uh, there's other examples. Thanks I for checking give, us out. But this government has presented a vision that says to the corporate sector and the oil and gas sector that they have responsibilities from a tax perspective. And what do we see? A revenue generated that goes towards funding vital programs in this country that ensure a fairness vision. That vi vision translates to child care, pharma care, a national child 
uh, school food program, among other things, Madam Speaker. Really? Good job. Honourable Member for Hamilton Centre. These Liberals are so out of touch, Madam Speaker, and just Matt as Green's New Democrats have, something have to delivered say. social programs to help Canadians, the Conservatives are already campaigning to cut dental care and pharma care, and it is absolutely shameful. People are drowning in debt just to keep up, while corporations are swimming in record profits. Liberals and Conservatives don't have the courage to challenge the status quo because it benefits them and their insider crony friends. Madam Speaker, new Democrats want to tackle corporate greed. Why won't this Liberal government? I want to remind the Honourable Member South, uh, for St. Margaret South Shore, oh, uh, he Raider, has Perkins. a habit of heckling and, and raising his voice where he's not supposed to. I would ask Funny. him to please refrain to do so. The Honourable Member, uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, it's, it's very interesting. I've heard that member now for a number of years talk about, yes, the issues that he's also raised, but a vision on the environment, which I'm wondering where exactly the NDP is on these days. Carbon pricing is vital to this country's future. It really reflects an approach of responsibility from an environment policy perspective that I thought they stood for, but they're wavering, they're flip-flopping, and I sympathize, as others do, with the NDP. It's a very difficult time. They have tough decisions to make, but I hope that they end up on the right side of history with this issue, Madam Speaker. I really do. Honourable Member for Halliburton, Water Lakesboro. Speaker, gas prices are the highest they've been in years. In my Ontario community, prices are as high as $1.80 a litre. Sadly, the Prime Minister gave no relief to Canadians and increased the carbon tax by 23%. Worse, when the carbon tax quadruples, it will add 61 cents to the price of a litre of gas. It's clear the Prime Minister is not worth the cost, as Canadians work twice as hard to take in half as much. When will the Prime Minister axe the tax so Canadians can afford to get to work, get groceries, take their kids to practice? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, what's baffling listening to the members from the side opposite is that they're not listening to economists from across this country. Last week it was about 200 economists, now it's over 300, it's about 350 economists have written to us an open letter saying specifically that most families receive more in rebates than they pay in carbon pricing. In other words, the policy is designed to ensure it does not raise the cost of living for most Canadians. And they say climate change, on the other hand, poses a real threat to Canadians' economic well-being. I'm going to listen to The Economist. A member for Halliburton, Kawatha, Lakes, Brock. Well, Speaker, the economists and the experts I listen to are the people in my riding paying $1.80 a litre for gasoline now. Yeah. The Prime Minister could reduce the price of a litre of gas by 20 cents right now by axing the carbon tax. Speaker, the Liberals have out-of-control spending and Canadians are broke. Rents, mortgages are doubling. Inflation through the roof. We spend more money to service the debt than we do transfers to the provinces on health care. Canadians are tapped out, Speaker. They're seeing no relief from this government. So when will the Prime Minister do the right thing? Call a carbon tax election. Speaker, let's listen to another expert. The former Conservative Prime Minister of the UK, Boris Johnson, came to Canada to teach the Conservative Party a lesson about the dangers of climate change denial nonsense. He said voters continue to care deeply about the environment. They up, have want flips? solutions that are going to be cost effective. Drakovich, what's Madam up? Madam Speaker, we agree, and both the PBO and over th 350 economists agree that the price, the carbon pricing and the rebates will help 8 out of 10 Canadians better off. Off. The Conservatives' only plan, Madam Speaker, is to let the planet burn. Their chief insult. Order, order. When the Honourable Member asks a question, he should listen to the answer and he shouldn't be heckling. And some of his colleagues were heckling as well. So I would just ask members to please tone down and, and listen to the questions and the answers that are being posed. The Honourable Member This speaker no seems to be a bit of a pain in the butt Canada's too. Canada's emissions are rising and the Liberal good. carbon tax is making life unaffordable. On April the 1st, the NDP Liberals increased the carbon tax and across the country today, Canadians are paying way more at the pumps. Many Canadians who have been struggling to pay their bills throughout the cold and dark winter, who might have been planning a summer road trip, might not be able to afford it now. Why are the NDP Liberals giving Canadians a cruel summer instead of axing the tax? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. 
I think it's important that we be clear. Under the previous Conservative government, ambitions were on the way up with no plan to bring them down. Right. We are on track to meet our 2026 targets. We are on track to meet the Paris targets. We are taking the action needed to re reduce emissions. But more than that, if we're going to talk about affordability, let's talk about an economist from Calgary who said carbon pricing is definitely not to blame for affordability challenges. Again, I'm going to listen to the economists. The Honour Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. I choose to listen to the people in my riding who are paying 20 cents more a litre because of the NDP Liberal carbon tax. An inconvenient truth for the Liberals is that the only time that emissions went down in Canada was under Prime Minister Stephen Harper's government. In fact, if they want to listen to someone, they should listen to a fellow Liberal, the Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, who after losing a by-election said the carbon tax is wrong. Tens of millions of Canadians agree. These are who the people we listen to. Why don't these NDP Liberals? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, if she's concerned, if the member opposite is concerned about the price of gas in Alberta, may want to speak to the Premier, who on April 1st increased the Alberta gas tax. And by the way, that's not connected to a rebate. Our federal carbon price backstop pays more to 8 out of 10 Canadians than they actually pay in carbon pricing. But the Premier's gas tax, that was just an add-on. The Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Madam Speaker, 40% debt to GDP, the metric the Finance Minister used just last year as her anchor that she's now cut loose. $40 billion more in debt last year, $40 billion more debt projected this fiscal year, $40 billion debt projected the following fiscal year. I sense a pattern. After nine years of this Liberal NDP government, Canadians are being asked to hold the line at 40-something, but there's no real plan for that. Will the Prime Minister tell Canadians under 40 how much of their future he's blown? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The member opposite is a graduate of the Ivy School of Business in my riding, Madam Speaker. He knows economics, so he knows, of course, that Canada has the lowest debt-to-GDP ratio in the G7, and that GDP debt-to-GDP ratio is set to continue to come down. But what he's really saying by raising these issues is that they don't stand in favour of a vision of fairness for this country, one of child care, farmer care, dental care, and building more homes. The National uh, School Food Program that my colleague mentioned before is also vital to that vision. They stand against all of it. The Honourable Member Calgary Centre, and I want to ask members not to be heckling. Now, Mr. Speaker, it appears that member didn't get the memo, but what's causing inflation in Canada is actually deficits, and the Bank of Canada governor has said so. The interest cost to service Canada's growing debt has risen to over $54 billion, doubling in the last few years. It's now more than what we spend on health care. This is a cascade of debt obligations, and there is no plan to reverse it. This NDP Liberal government is not worth the cost. Will the Prime Minister advise why he continues a fiscal course that will saddle young Canadians with sky-high debt for years? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Now I really have to question the member's understanding of economics, Madam Speaker. I, I, thought, he, I thought he knew, but I wonder now. Inflation is a global phenomenon, and in Canada, in fact, it's declining. What I would say is back to that member, what is he going to do when it comes to voting on the budget? Is he going to stand and, and declare an intention to support childcare in this country, to make sure that we have a vision of fairness so that kids can go uh, to school with their bellies full, so they can have dental care in this country, pharmacare, all these things? He's against it. The Honourable Member for Juliette. Madam Speaker, in their budgets, the Liberals like to illustrate their measures with concrete examples of fictitious citizens. Let's give them some of their own medicine so they understand what seniors are going through. Rose is 72. Inflation is nipping at her heels. She can't afford groceries anymore. Gas prices are keeping her from getting out and about. Her taxes went through the roof in the last property assessment because of the real estate bubble. If she were 75, she'd get almost $1,000 more a year in OAS. But since she's 70, too, she gets nothing. Why are the Liberals turning their back on her? The Honourable Minister, 
Madam Speaker, our seniors are an absolute priority for the Government of Canada, and we've made very significant investments on their behalf. I'd like to ask my colleagues, since housing is a priority for Quebecers and access to housing is a priority, and fighting climate change is a priority for Quebecers, and since electrification of vehicles and economic growth are priorities for the Bloc Québécois, why are they voting against all that? The Honourable Member for Joliet, there's not a cent for seniors in this budget. Let's talk about housing. Imagine a Quebecer who's looking for a one-bedroom apartment in July but can't afford the $1,600 rent. He doesn't have access to affordable housing because the federal government has invested only 6% of the money in Quebec. And he sees in the budget that the federal government will backload until after the next election 97% of its spending on apartment construction and 91% of the investment in housing infrastructure. It'll be years before he sees the impact of the budget measures. And that's only if the Conservatives don't reverse them completely. Why not put the money up now? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Madam Speaker, I'm looking at everything we're doing in housing, for example, building new housing, accelerated con construction, the construction of affordable housing, helping young families in need, helping young families, young couples get access to property. And the Bloc is today saying that's important, but they're voting against everything we're doing. The Conservatives have so much influence over the Bloc that they keep voting along with them. It's shameful. Honourable Member for Yellowhead. After nine years, this NDP Liberal government has hit Canadians with another carbon tax increase of 23 per cent. Grocery prices are climbing, making families hey, choose between heating and eating. Conservatives tried to ease this burden by passing Bill C-234, which axes the tax on farmers. But this week, the Liberals blocked it. They are hell-bent on making life more expensive. If they're so confident in their costly plan, will they let Canadians decide and call for a carbon tax election? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I'm Speaker. I want to be clear about the affordability piece to the way the carbon price works, because it's a carbon price and a carbon rebate. And I believe that the members opposite should be very clear with their constituents about whether they're asking the carbon rebates to not land in their bank accounts. Again, going back to what the economists state, an economist reviewed the carbon pricing and rebate system and said, we estimate that the medium annual net cost of carbon taxes for households in Ontario in 2023 was negative, meaning that most households received $300 more in rebates than they paid in carbon taxes. Hey Grimes, what's up? How are you? The Honourable Member for Simcoe Gray. Madam Speaker, after nine years of this NDP Liberal government, they spend more servicing the national debt than on health care. After nine years of this NDP Liberal government, Canadian soldiers eat at food banks and veterans are living in their cars. After nine years of this NDP Liberal government, seniors can't afford to eat and they can't afford to heat. After nine years, Madam Speaker, despite deficit after deficit and record debt, the problems are getting worse. Canadians know the Prime Minister is not worth the cost. When will the NDP Liberal government admit they have a spending problem, not a revenue problem? The Honourable Minister. Ms. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, that's a bit rich coming from the party opposite. Let's take a walk down memory lane. When it's they were in party, rich. when the Conservative Party of Canada was in party under Stephen Harper, let's see what they did to veterans. They slashed the Veterans what Affairs budget. About? They closed nine Veterans Affairs offices, and um, also they cut the, the workforce by 1,000 individuals that provided direct services to veterans. Mr. Speaker, we'll take no lessons from the Conservative Party of Canada. <laughs> Leamington. Madam Speaker, after the release of the tax and spend budget this week, everyone knows that this NDP Liberal government, after nine long years, and this Prime Minister are just not worth the cost. Bill C-234 was to provide some desperately needed relief for our farmers who produce food for Canadians. That bill passed this chamber. Then the Prime Minister uh, bullied the Senators into gutting that bill and leaving Canadians with higher costs. When will the Prime Minister call for a vote on the original motion or call a carbon tax election? Madam Speaker, uh, if the Bill C-234 was so important in the Senate, then why five members of their own caucus didn't show up to vote? And by the way, they had the opportunity to debate 
C234, when it comes back to the House, when we come back in one week, they traded two private members' bills, it wasn't C234. So it's so important, I would advise my member of parliament, or my colleague, to What's lobby up, Don his ba particular Don colleagues Bay Queens, and stop how are you? politicizing this issue. What's going on? The Honourable Member for levy Latpinière. Madam Speaker, this government's liberal uh, has a funny face. inflationary policies have made everything more expensive. Gas has gone up so much. Food is unaffordable. Canadians are hungry and their housing is too expensive. The Canadian dream of owning a home is now out of reach for a generation of hardworking young adults. Madam Speaker, will a policy of a dollar of savings for each dollar of new programs be implemented by this inflationary government? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. We work hard every day to deliver for Canadians. Conservatives pretend to care. They've already said they'll vote against the budget this year. How cruel and heartless do you have to be to vote against feeding hungry kids Shame. or giving Shame. seniors the dental coverage Shame. they need to get their teeth Shame. fixed or supporting people with disabilities with hundreds of dollars tax-free more per month or building more child Shame. care spaces so parents can get back to work or providing insulin to people living with diabetes. You can't vote against those things if you actually care. They don't care. So the Honourable Member for Victoria. Madam Speaker, the Liberals should never have bought the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Right. It threatens our climate and our coasts. Yes. And Canadian taxpayers are now on the hook for this government's irresponsible spending to the tune of $35 billion. Liberals ignore, ignored the calls from environmentalists and coastal Indigenous nations, instead choosing to be in the pocket of big oil and gas. Why does this government keep backing big polluters when they know this pipeline is an environmental and economic disaster? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. If Canada, if Canada is to succeed, Madam Speaker, we know that we have to get our resources to market, and that's why the TMX pipeline is so important, but the member knows, or ought to know, that the government does not intend to be the long-term owner of the project. A divestment process will be initiated once the project is more advanced, de-risked, and essentially with consultations, and essentially when consultations with Indigenous peoples are completed. This is the vision that we've always laid out, and it's one that we'll stick to. The Honourable Member for What's up, Pickles? Pickles? How are you today? Did they, What's going in on, their Paul? budget on Thursday, the Liberals <laughs> made a lot of announcements on housing, but they did not make the $600 million investment in the territories that Nunavut, Northwest Territories, and the Yukon have been desperately asking for. When I go home, I'm told more heartbreaking stories of crumbling and overcrowded homes. Why won't the Minister listen to the territorial premiers and give them the funding they need to address the housing crisis. Hi, Lisa. How are you today? Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague for her question. She's been a strong advocate on housing across the Arctic and northern reason, regions. We're the first government ever in history to have uh, direct agreements with Indigenous governments to address their housing needs. We have invested billions of dollars, in fact, over $3 billion in housing across the territories in a number of ways to help increase the housing and ensure that people have housing that is affordable to them. See the next thing that we. Climate change means more flooding events of increasing intensity and oh severity. Lord. This guy's going to show us how it flooding, is. Homeowners in areas flooding, like those in Come parts on. of Pierrefo in my riding, hit by flooding in 2017 and 2019, worry about the rising cost of flood insurance, and that's if they're lucky enough to remain eligible for flood insurance coverage. Can the Minister of Emergency Preparedness? Tell this House how this week's budget is coming to the aid of climate vulnerable homeowners. The Honourable Minister of Emergency Preparedness. Madam Speaker, I want to thank the member for his very strong advocacy on flood protection. Uh, we know that the devastating impact that climate change is having on Canadians. Insurance companies are paying uh, billions of dollars, and that those costs are being passed on Canadians, making it even more expensive to, uh, to own homes. With the Budget 2024, we are increasing our investments on national 
uh, low cost uh, flood insurance program. Over the next year, we will work with the province and territories to put this program in place. And Madam Speaker, we will be there for Canadians when climate change impacts their lives. Thank you. The Honourable Member for St. Albert Edmonton. Madam Speaker, this week oh, right. the RCMP raided Cooper. the home of the Prime Minister's top arrive scammer, Christian Firth. The raid is connected to a proposal that Firth's GC strategies sent to the Deputy Prime Minister and her former Chief of Staff, Jeremy Broadhurst. So, what communications did the Deputy Prime Minister and her office have with GC strategies regarding a proposal that has led to an RCMP raid? Here, here. Question. The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, again, just because my colleague on the other side of the aisle repeats something doesn't necessarily attach it to the They're facts. The same old the facts, lines, Madam exact Speaker, same in lines. This case are well known. The RCMP, the one thing that he said is that's entirely factual is the RCMP are looking into this matter. And that's why I would urge people to be careful before they invent things and ascribe mm -hmm. things to what is an ongoing police investigation. Our government has said that people have a responsibility to be judicious with taxpayers' mm -hmm. money, and those that aren't will face the consequences. I remember St. Albert and the Tim. Madam Speaker, the two-person basement company GC Strategies received more than $100 million from this NDP government, including $20 million for nothing on a rive scam. We know of a link between GC Strategies and the Deputy Prime Minister and her office regarding a proposal that has led to an RCMP raid. So, has the Deputy Prime Minister been contacted by the RCMP and will she fully cooperate with the police investigation? Again, Madam Speaker, my friend on the other side simply asserts a series of things that he knows very well are not accurate and attempts to connect the series of dots that mm. simply can't be connected. Yeah, that's obvious. He should stick to the basic facts. The RCMP following information that was given to them by Thank the you, Border Bank Services Ruppelman. Agency uh, that's has awesome. decided to Welcome look into to a club. series of allegations. They got obviously crew take here. their work very seriously and we should allow Canada's National Police Force to do their work and not simply make up stuff in the House of Commons beside the work that they're doing. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Regina, Wiscana. Madam Speaker, after nine years of this Liberal NDP government, this Prime Minister is just not worth the cost or the corruption. The Arrive Can app was originally supposed to cost $80,000, only to skyrocket to $60 million, triggering an RCMP investigation. The contractor admitted to this House that he does not feel ashamed, and the Liberals have not even asked him to repay the money. Madam Speaker, when will the Prime Minister get Canadians their money back? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Madam Speaker, I had a chance earlier in today's question period uh, to answer that question. I'm happy to do it again. Madam Speaker, our government has worked with the Auditor General's the office. The seems to forget where he is. There's an internal investigation being conducted by the Border Services Agency. All of these investigations will, unlike some of our friends on the other side, establish the facts of what happened. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's misused taxpayers' money will be required to repay it, and anybody who has misused taxpayers' who money that? will face the consequences. And that's why we're pleased that the RCMP are looking into this matter. Here. I for Regina, West Canada. But, but Madam Speaker, hey Bruce, this app up? went live four years ago in the early days of the pandemic and has been the subject of questioning and scrutiny ever since. While Canadians were losing their businesses and being told by this Prime Minister that we were all in this together, insiders at GC Strategies were milking taxpayers for millions of dollars. Madam Speaker, when will the Prime Minister get taxpayers their money back on a rive scam? I don't think that money is coming back to us, guys. What do you think? Madam Speaker, we have said continually, and we'll say it again, if people have misused taxpayers' money or have misappropriated public funds, of course efforts will be undertaken to recuperate that money. That's what a responsible government does. What's up, Pluto? How are you? A responsible government, Madam Speaker, allows the internal reviews and audits that are underway to determine exactly what money uh, might be subject to the reimbursement and what's the appropriate process There's to have that no money reimbursed. reimbursement. At Come the on. same time, Madam Speaker, the RCMP are also looking into this matter. The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher-Les-Patrouilles-Vercher. 
Madam Speaker, gas went up by 15 cents in How one single How bad did you get hit with gas Thursday price morning. increases? It's highway robbery. And that's not because of the carbon tax, which doesn't apply in Quebec and didn't change Thursday morning. Why did it actually Clint, happen? Man, because what's of going these on? greedy oil companies. They're getting ready for a summer by taking money out of people's pockets. Companies like Suncor and CNRL, which raked in $8 billion in profits last year, and yet they're being subsidized by the Liberals. Over 10 years, $83 billion. The Liberals also bought a $34 billion pipeline. Isn't it time to cut off the money for these oil companies? The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, the oil and gas sector has to pay its fair share. It's bringing in rep record profits and needs to invest in reducing emissions. We Ooh, have media, how are you? Did I catch you earlier? I don't think I did. Fuels. And we're asking the wealthiest 1% to pay a little more. The Conservatives are against our cap on oil and gas emissions. The Conservatives, in fact, are taking their marching orders from the oil and gas sector. Order. The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Bergères. Well, I think that the Liberals are going to have to tell us what an efficient subsidy to the oil and gas sector would even be. Now, the carbon tax doesn't apply in Quebec and has only a 0.15% impact on inflation. But Conservatives from Quebec are constantly weeping and wailing about it. Whereas when gas goes up by 15 cents due to their fossil fuel friends, they don't say a word. There's complete silence when the oil and gas companies take money out of Quebecers' pockets. Same thing when we say that the government should stop paying fossil fuel companies. Does this government think that it's a good thing that they pay through the nose to these oil and gas companies, and yet these companies make consumers pay more? The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, I'm glad we're hearing the truth from the Bloc Québécois which is that the federal carbon tax, the federal carbon price does not apply in Quebec. They should speak to the Conservatives who don't seem to understand this. We agree that all sectors of the economy need to reduce emissions, including oil and gas companies. We are doing that work to ensure that it happens. The Honourable Member for... No, not the Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchères, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I meant to say Madam Speaker, it's an easy Canadians mistake are struggling to, make. to put food on the table on the table rather. Meanwhile, this Prime Minister's Arrive Can app has made the GC strategies owners multimillionaires. Canadians could have gotten some answers about Arrive Can this week, but instead the Prime Minister enforced silence and ignored Canadians' questions. This is $60 million in taxpayer money, money that went into the pockets of millionaires. Will the PM give Canadians this wasted money back? The Honourable Minister of Transport. No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, no. I think this is Madam Speaker's uh, no, 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 on no, no, the no, dope. No, there's the Minister of Transport over here. I'm not the Minister of Transport. Now, Madam Speaker, thank you. As my colleague knows, it's simply not true that the government wasn't transparent. My colleague keeps saying that, but he knows it's not true. I've been working with parliamentary committees. We've been working with the Auditor General. General. We completely agree with the idea that all those who inappropriately receive taxpayer money We'll have to pay it back. And as my colleague knows, the RCMP is investigating this matter. I need this camera. The Honourable Member, Madam Speaker, at a time when Canadians are working so hard without being able to actually get appropriately compensated for their work, consultants involved in the Arrive Can disaster received $60 million. That's taxpayer money. Taxpayer money that was wasted. And they got that money for doing no work. So Canadians have a simple question, and the answer should also be simple. When, when will the Prime Minister give taxpayers their money back? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Hello, Cindy. Hello, John. How are you folks Madam today? Speaker, Bonjour. As I said in English a few moments ago, Bienvenue. my colleague knows that there's an inquiry happening at the CBSA, an internal inquiry. And it's 
for that exact purpose, to find out whether money was spent inappropriately, we're going to have to wait to understand what the facts are before asking for money to be paid back. We understand Canadians' concerns about this. We share Canadians' concerns about using taxpayer money appropriately. Calgary Rocky Ridge. Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister's Arrive Scam app was supposed to cost $80,000. The Prime Minister chose the app, mandated its use, and along with the NDP voted $60 million to fund it. Shady contractors got rich without doing any IT work, while the app itself failed and erroneously sent tens of thousands of Canadians into quarantine. The RCMP are knocking, the main contractors got $20 million. When will the Prime Minister get Canadians their money back? Yeah. Yeah. Madam Speaker, the same question begets the same answer. We've yep. said from the beginning, same the answer. government has welcomed the scrutiny of parliamentary committees, worked with the Auditor General, and implemented her recommendations. My colleague, the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, has changed the way that these contracts are awarded and the oversight provisions. We'll continue to do what's necessary to ensure taxpayers' money is well spent, and we'll continue to obviously hold those to account that don't follow the rules. The Honourable Member for Ottawa Vanier. Madam Speaker, our veterans and their families have sacrificed a great deal for our country. We have a solemn, sacred duty to support our veterans who served with honour and courage. We know that it can be difficult for a veteran transitioning to civilian life to access medical care. When they were in the armed forces, veterans received their health care from the forces directly. Can the Minister for Veterans tell us how she will help veterans and their family have access to these services? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank my friend and colleague for her important question and her hard work for veterans in her community. Budget 2024 will increase support to veterans and their families. Telemedicine services throughout the country will be offered to veterans and their families. That is one of the significant measures for veterans in this new budget. The pilot project has been a success. Broadening these programs will help veterans access health care during their transition to civilian life. Our government will always be there to support veterans and their families. Thank you. The Honourable Member Sturgeon River Parkland. Madam Speaker, after nine years of this NDP Liberal government, Canada has entered uncharted territory. This government has made Canada a candy store for car thieves, and under their watch, organized crime has made Canada a key exporter of deadly fentanyl. Canadians and now the whole world know that this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. This NDP Liberal government must take responsibility for this failure, which has brought crime, chaos and corruption, not only to Canadian streets, but the streets of the whole world. Perhaps is there a Liberal Party leadership candidate who can rise and tell us who's been running this place for the past nine years so we can hold them to account. It's a pretty good one. He stuck it to the Trudeau right there without even mentioning his name. <laughs> Thank Great. you, uh, Madam Speaker. Look, oh, this guy's fear dead on the inside. Does nothing to encourage Phony Canadians Maloney. to have more confidence in our justice system. We have one of the safest countries in the entire world. We had an auto summit just a few short months ago where we brought all of the different parties together. Since that time, you've seen an increase in the uh, measures taken by police and other authorities across the country, including the federal government, and car theft is going down and recovering of stolen cars is going up. These measures continue to work, and we will continue to work with other levels of government and other necessary authorities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this Liberal government has been in power for nine years. We all know this, but I will repeat it. This government is not worth the cost. Montreal is turning into the Wild West. Criminals just don't care about authority. In fact, on Wednesday, some car thieves actually tried to run over police officers. Is, should that really be the case in a civilized country like Canada? Will the Prime Minister of this Liberal Bloc Québécois coalition, will this Prime Minister finally put an end to these lax crime policies and put these reoffending auto thieves in prison? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Madam Speaker, one of the pieces of good news in the budget, of which there were many, and my colleague knows this very well, is that my colleague, the Minister of Justice, has committed to making amendments to the Criminal Code. 
specifically for that purpose, to change, to change penalties for car thieves, as my colleague is saying. We have had discussions with our essential partners to prevent auto theft, and we will continue to do all that is necessary to prevent this problem. Prince George. Since 2016, over 40,000 Canadians have died from overdose. Over a billion dollars has been spent with zero results. BC's Deputy Commissioner of the RCMP has confirmed that organized crime is indeed trafficking safe supply. It's going straight from the pharmacy to the hands of criminals, unleashing crime, chaos and disorder in our communities. After nine years of this Prime Minister and his NDP servants, Canadians are finding out that they're not worth the cost. When will the Minister of Safe Supply take responsibility for her failed drug policies and put an end to taxpayer-funded drug fu policies? He stumbled through the end there. Having a tough time. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We need all oh partners Lord. working together to Some address twist. the illegal toxic drug supply in our communities. We have and we will continue to support provinces and territories so they so that they can deliver the full suite resources that are needed. Our government will use every tool at our disposal to end this national public health crisis. The Honourable Member for Kingston and the Islands. Madam Speaker, Canada's go, support Barrett. for Ukraine has been unwavering. Unlike the Conservative oh no, Party opposite, which has I voted my, against uh, Ukraine multiple times now, we are stepping up our support through Budget 2024. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Development please tell this House about the important news for Ukraine through the latest budget? Here, here. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Madam International Speaker. Development. Oh, Our oh government Lord. has been there since day one Go for get Ukraine. Him. Budget 2024 is yet another step in making sure that Ukraine wins in its fight against Putin's illegal invasion. This budget includes almost $3 billion in additional financing, including for lethal and non-lethal weapons, including funding through the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development for the reconstruction of Ukraine, and we'll see how we can use seized Russian assets for the restoration of Ukraine. We have always been there to support Ukraine. Here, here. You think that lady supports Ukraine? Give me a break. The Honourable Member Churchill, Kiwana Nukaski. Madam Speaker, the NDP successfully fought against cuts to Indigenous services, Ashton. but it's clear the Liberals still don't get it. Let's look at housing and infrastructure, where the Liberals spent less than 1% of what First Nations need. First Nations here in Manitoba face a serious infrastructure crisis, but this government still delays helping them, preferring to pat themselves on the back for just not being Conservatives. Will the Liberals commit to partner with Manitoba First Nations to build the infrastructure they desperately need, including on the airport in Wasagamac? and the desperately needed east side all-weather road. The Honourable Minister of Indigenous Services. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I thank oh. the member opposite for her I ongoing advocacy. Brutal. Since 2015, we've increased spending on Indigenous priorities by 180 percent. That's right, Madam Speaker. That's the abysmal state that we received uh, this file in in 2015 yeah, from a previous Harper Conservatives who gave zero cares about yeah, the lives of Indigenous zero. people. In fact, Budget 20, uh, 24 dedicates over nine and a half billion dollars to Indigenous priorities. A full 25 percent of the budget goes towards Indigenous priorities in this country. We'll continue on the path of reconciliation together. The Honourable Member for Kitchener Centre. Madam Speaker, in the midst of a climate crisis, the oil and gas industry raked in $38 billion in pure profit in 2022 by gouging Canadians at the pumps, fueling inflation. And despite claims of fairness in this year's budget, we learned this week that big oil's lobbyists convinced this government to shelve an excess profit tax on these record-breaking profits that could have generated $4.2 billion to help make life more affordable for regular Canadians. Can anyone in this government justify to Canadians what's fair about this? The Honourable, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would remind the member what I said earlier when the NDP posed the question on this issue. Introducing a, inef excuse me, eliminating inefficient fossil fuel Hung subsidies up on and introducing a tax on share buybacks. I've been In there. addition, changes to capital gains that will benefit 
on the whole, the vast majority of small businesses in this country, by decreasing the inclusionary rate and increasing the lifetime capital gains exemption, means that it's the largest corporations that will be asked to pay more to ensure a greater vision of fairness in the country. And that brings us to the end of question period on this Friday. I have a point of order, the Honourable Deputy Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, We're just going to wrap that up then. Um, so, because they, they, they went down. So that's question period Canada for Friday, uh, April 19th. Pretty interesting. And it's been a wild week. There's been so many things happening. Uh, pretty crazy. Uh, would like to thank all the new people that came to watch the channel, whatever. We watch this Canadian soap opera every day. We try to keep it pleasant. There's a couple of words we try not to use in the chat. I try not to use them in the videos either. Just because people have comfort levels. I get that. Um, and it's just Canadian politics. There's really no room for uh, whatever. My name's Aaron. This is Question Period Canada. I would like to thank Everybody that's been watching, we're going to continue to make it better. We've got to run now and make some other videos. Uh, I've got a couple of people like, I don't know, there's a guy named Paul that's been trying to help me out. Not going to lie, Paul. Not going to tell them who you are, but appreciate it, brother. And so many other people have been helping out. Uh, I've been trying to be busy. Oh, this is the piece about that Bill C. Thrix C. Um, 65 that people wanted to know about. So the election is supposed to be set for the last week of October in 2025. The liberals are trying to put that push that back one week, which wouldn't seem like a big deal. But the reason that it's a big deal is because there's a bunch of these two term uh, MPs that are not going to be reelected that won't qualify for a pension. But if they extend by a week, well, all the two-term uh, MPs are going to get full pension uh, from the Liberal and NDP party, which is a crock of uh, BS, in my opinion, which it shows the cowardice and, I don't know, the, the if you scrutinize this, these guys do not look good Like in doing that. They're ripping off Canadians forever, and it's a long-term plan. They didn't just see this coming. That's what uh, C-65 is about. You can check out Bill, Bill C-65, look it up online. I'm probably going to make a video about it because I saw another video and I was like, oh, people need to know about that. It seems like a minor detail pushing back an election by a week, but it's not. It just shows how dishonest they really are, bending the rules for their own convenience. It's a beautiful day here in Nova Scotia, so I'm going to go and enjoy some of that. Thank you all for watching, everybody. Uh, it's been a blast. We'll be back around over the weekend releasing other videos. Check out our shorts. Um, so, yes, like, subscribe. Uh, and if you enjoy watching this live uh, broadcast, we're here every day. We'll be back. And we're trying to build this community where we learn and watch the soap opera together. And it's happening, guys. I like this group. It's awesome. Once in a while, we'll have someone blow through the room that decides that they want to drop F-bombs but not be called sir. You can take a hike. Honestly, do not come back. Not interested. That's it. I'm here, and I don't mean to leave on a negative note, but can you piss me off? You can go take a walk with Trudeau. Like, subscribe. This is Question Period Canada. We'll be back on Monday with more Question period, Canada, live broadcast. That's it. Have something healthy to eat today. Try to stay warm. Easy thing to do in Nova Scotia. We'll catch you next video. Thank you all so much for watching. Catch you next time. We're out.